want to ask you a question. What happened on the 29th of October, 1969? Landing on the moon? Close. But on this day, something equally enormous happened. Namely, the first message was sent over the Internet. So let me explain just how difficult it actually was to send that first message. So the Internet was super tiny. And at half past ten in the evening, researchers had gathered down in Los Angeles and at Stanford up in Menlo Park to send the first test message. And they had agreed to send the message login, like logging into a remote computer. And because this was challenging, they called each other on the phone to make sure the message arrived. So there were these guys down in Los Angeles at their computer, and they typed the first letter, L. And they asked on the phone, did you see the L? And the excited message comes back, yes, yes, we see the L. And we sent the first letter over the internet. They typed the second letter, the O, and ask again, did you see the O? And they said, yes, we also see the O. And they typed the letter G, and the system crashed. <laughs> <laughs> so the internet is a little bit larger now, and we use it to send vast quantities of data. I've recently moved into a new apartment, and just like in many places in the world, I sign up for internet like you sign up for power or water. The internet is everywhere, and it certainly changed the way that we live today. So I'm working on a quantum internet, because I believe that it will similarly revolutionize the world. So of course you're asking now, what is this quantum internet? So on the surface, it looks a lot like a classical internet. There's computers, and we're going to send data from one computer to another. Only on the quantum internet, this is a quantum computer, and I'm sending quantum data, quantum bits or qubits, from one place to another. So these qubits are pretty special. For example, we cannot copy a qubit. Unlike a classical bit that can be either 0 or 1, a qubit can be both 0 and 1 at the same time. So you might imagine that instead of sending pictures of a cat that is either dead or alive, <laughs> <laughs> we are going to send a Schrodinger's cat that is both dead and alive or 0 and 1 at the same time. So these qubits are pretty cool, but it brings us to the question, why do we want to send them around? So a quantum internet has many applications that are impossible on the internet today. It can make many things more efficient. And in fact, to use a quantum internet, you also don't need to have a large quantum computer at home. So probably the most famous application of a quantum internet is to use it for secure communication. So secure communication means that I am going to send data to you, like my credit card information, or maybe state secrets, and I want that no one is able to listen into this communication. A quantum internet allows us to use quantum key distribution, that enables secure communication whose security relies only on the laws of quantum mechanics. In particular, it's secure even if some eavesdropper who's trying to snoop into our communication has a quantum computer. And it remains secure even if this eavesdropper buys a quantum computer tomorrow. So that's pretty nice. But the quantum internet has many other, possibly less well-known applications, which personally I find probably even more exciting. Using a quantum internet, we can use a quantum computer in the cloud. 
So quantum computers promise to solve many problems much faster than a classical computer. In particular, we think that they're extremely good at simulating problems in quantum chemistry. So you might imagine that in the future, if you want to explore a new material or a new medicine, you don't first go into the lab and do some hugely long, time-consuming experiment, but you're first going to run a quick simulation on your quantum computer to see whether that makes sense at all. Now, quantum computers <coughs> are pretty expensive. I sort of expect that I will actually be dead by the time that we all have a quantum computer at home or in our office. But of course, we want to use this computing power. So the first quantum computers are likely going to be somewhere in the cloud, and I'm going to pay, say, to use that for an hour. Now, maybe I want to use this quantum computer to perform a simulation on some proprietary material, or possibly even my own DNA. So I don't want to give my DNA to this quantum computer. So it turns out that using a quantum internet, we can use this remote quantum computer in the cloud, securely in the sense that it has no idea what we're going to use it for. Quantum internet can also do all kinds of other cool things. Like it's good at synchronizing clocks much more accurately than we can do classically. It can be used to enhance password identification to some server far away. And curiously, we can even use it to play better at an online game. So what is it about these qubits that is so special that it enables all these applications? Two qubits can be entangled using a quantum internet. Now, entanglement also still sounds pretty mysterious. But there's actually only two features of quantum entanglement that lie at the bottom of all of these applications. So if you understand these two features, you will have a pretty good intuition of what a quantum internet is good for. So what are these two features? So the first one is called maximum coordination. Let's say I've used the quantum internet to entangle a qubit here in Vienna with some qubit far away, somewhere down in Sydney. And I'm going to perform a measurement on my qubit. And let's imagine a friend down in Sydney performs exactly the same measurement. <coughs> now, if we make the same measurement, we will get the same measurement outcome instantaneously. You can think of a measurement as asking a question to a qubit. I can ask, qubit, are you pointing left or are you pointing right? And if I ask the question to my qubit here in Vienna and my friend asks the same question down in Sydney, then if I see left, he will see left, and if I see right, he will see right. And this happens instantaneously even though the answer is not determined ahead of time. And the cool thing is that this actually works for any question that we might have asked to this qubit. If I had asked, are you red or green, we would have seen exactly the same. We get always the same answer. So entanglement is maximally coordinated. And it is this feature that makes it naturally so suited for tasks that require coordination or synchronization. So remember I said there were two features of quantum entanglement? So what is this second feature? The second feature of quantum entanglement is that it's inherently private. If I have two qubits and they're completely entangled with each other, then it's physically impossible for any other qubit or actually anything else in the universe to have any share of this entanglement. This means that if I have a qubit that is completely entangled with your qubit, no one else can have a share of the entanglement. Our two entangled qubits form a private connection that no one else can share. So entanglement cannot be shared, and it's inherently private, and it's this feature that makes it naturally very suited for secure communication. 
So remember these two features? It's maximally coordinated and inherently private. So now I've told you all these things about qubits and entanglement, but given that quantum entanglement is so cool, you might ask, why don't we have a quantum internet yet? It turns out that we can actually send qubits over short distances. You can go online and actually buy a commercially available box that performs quantum key distribution, quantum secure communication, over standard telecom fiber, over distances of roughly 100 kilometers. So the real challenge in building a quantum internet is to get these qubits to travel further than these 100 kilometers. <coughs> so of course you might be asking, why is it so difficult for these qubits to traverse long distances? If I want to send a qubit down a communication line, <coughs> we are sending a single photon, one particle of light. So you can imagine that if I take one single particle of light and I send it down a communication line, very soon it will be lost. Remember that also qubits cannot be copied. So if it's lost, it's gone. I cannot resend and try again. So how can we hope to send these qubits over long distances? So fortunately, as, as I mentioned, we can actually send them over short distances. So let's put like a box in the middle. <coughs> and the box is not so far away from the left, and it's not so far away from the right, namely close enough that I can send qubits both from the left and from the right to the box. All right. Let's try that. What we're going to do is we're going to take two entangled qubits on the left, and I'm going to send one of them to the box. Box is not far away, so we can do that. I'm going to take another two qubits, which are entangled. I'm going to send one of them to the box. So now we have entanglement with this box. So the cool thing is that there is a procedure called entanglement swapping with which we can glue this entanglement together and create entanglement over the entire distance. That's pretty cool. So such a box is called a quantum repeater, and we can use it to make entanglement over long distances. But you're probably saying, what about this um, entanglement? You promised us that we could send my Schrodinger cat this particular data qubit that I want to send somewhere else. So there's a nice feature of quantum that if we have entanglement, we can now send a data qubit by teleporting it across. So we, I take my yellow data qubit and I teleport it to the other side. So this way we can send qubits over long distances. <coughs> so we're probably saying, you know, this talk is getting more fantastical by the minute. <laughs> First there were these qubits, now we're even going to teleport them around. So we are actually actively working on this box, the quantum repeater. And by 2020, we want to have the first demonstration network in the Netherlands that showcases this box, the quantum repeater. It might become the first quantum internet in the world that actually connects small quantum computers, small quantum processors, in such a way that we can send qubits from any of these quantum computers to another. We can make entanglement between any of these two cities. So you can sort of think that we are now on the edge of the quantum 1969. And in 2020, we want to send the first quantum message over what might be the first quantum internet. Thank you very much. <laughs>